How can nature thrive in cities with exploding populations? To discuss the power of nature in cities, please welcome moderator Karen Weigert of Slipstream, Michael Berkowitz of 100 Resilient Cities, Maria Chiara Pastore of Stefano Boeri Architetti, from the University of Louisville, Aruni Bhatnagar, and Yi Ching from the Shenzhen Institute of Building Research. Thank you, and welcome to our panel. We are delighted to have this conversation here today in Chicago. And uh, Chicago is often called the city that works, or it's called the city of broad shoulders. But the actual motto of the city of Chicago is city in a garden. And that is really the power that we are here to discuss today. Our founders knew it a long time ago, but if you walk around, you don't always see it. And so we want to explore today that power of nature and how that is integral to a thriving city. And so, Michael, I'd love to start with you. In the past few years, you've worked with cities all over the world, and you've worked with them on their most pressing challenges. Yeah. How are you seeing nature as a part of the solutions they're trying to bring forward? Yeah, so thanks, and it's, it's great to be here. Um, you know, in, in many ways, two big themes that we see cities struggling with are this question of equity and cohesion um, at the same time as climate change. These are, the, in some ways, the, the intersecting themes. And the great thing about green infrastructure, about nature, uh, is that it helps cities tackle both of those things. Mm -hmm. It helps them um, at once you know, reduce heat effects, improve the biodiversity, reduce flooding, uh, do all that stuff. But then, at the same time, unlike the gray infrastructure that can do some of those same things, often can bring communities together, provides places for people to exercise, to uh, meet each other, to be together, um, all of those things. And so, you know, in resilience, often we preach, you know, how do you have one intervention that strengthens you across a number of different areas? And green infrastructure is something that does that. Mm -hmm. And I'd love to talk a little bit more about that. Can you give us an example or two? What are the kinds of things that cities are doing that brings forward green infrastructure, you called it, or essentially those elements of nature that provide those benefits. Right. Um, so uh, one, one example could be, uh, uh, for those of you, does, who, who, who here knows what the big U is? Uh, uh, in, <laughs> so uh, post Sandy, uh, we helped the city of New York run a design competition yeah. uh, around uh, how it could prevent uh, and, and reduce the impacts of uh, rising seas and storm surge. Um, and the old way we do it is, you know, figure out how high the sea was going to get, how big the storms were going to get, uh, pour concrete and build a wall. Um, and a group, a consortium really, led by Bjarke Engels, uh, uh, designed this series of interconnected green infrastructure around lower Manhattan. Uh, and uh, what that does is it connects people to the river in different ways, it gives them places to exercise, it improves biodiversity, it reduces impact from heat wave. And it has all the benefits of the gray infrastructure, the wall, um, that, that you might have built around uh, lower Manhattan. And, and that's really, hopefully, you know, th those, all those other aspects are what we call the resilience dividend, but ultimately just you know, are, are multiple benefits that strengthen the city. Mm -hmm. you know, when we think about the, city, the question of cities and thriving cities, I often don't have a cardiologist on stage with me. And so, Rooney, I'd like to come to you. Here you are. You're a cardiologist in Chicago. And yet, you're looking at questions of nature in cities. Please tell us why. So we, we know for a long time that heart disease has been the leading cause of death, not only in the United States, but worldwide. And uh, although from the last uh, few hundred, hundred years, we've been known, we, this is at least for the last uh, hundred years almost, there has been uh, this recognition of how bad the disease is, and the rates of heart disease have been coming down. But in the last few years, uh, the, actually, the, the decline has stalled. And then there is actually now an increase in the incidence of heart disease. So our children were the first generation in 100 years who would not see an increase in life expectancy. So there is urgent need to, to rethink what heart disease is and how it, is a, sort of, how it originates in, in different environments. We do know that about 60 to 70% of heart disease is environmental. It comes from the type of environments we live in. Mm -hmm. So we're running out of options. And so we thought that maybe what we need to do is to look at how we live and, and how we uh, sort of uh, play out our lives in these uh, constricted urban environments. 
And so one of the big features of that is that there is a lot of air pollution, there's a lot of noise, there's a lot of light pollution. And so um, we, we are sort of exploring the idea that maybe nature is the answer. Maybe we need to uh, make cities greener and not in a random sort of uh, undesigned fashion, but in a very thoughtful, deliberate manner so that we can place trees in, in certain areas where, for example, there are high levels of air pollution, whether we need to buffer uh, noise and light, and then be able to understand what type of benefits trees provide to humans and why is this sort of native, this relationship. There is this idea called the biophilia hypothesis, which means that individuals or humans have evolved with trees and plants around them, and so when divorced from nature, there is a, it is a source of stress. And so maybe that stress is driving the high rates of heart disease in communities, and so we thought that if we can uh, sort of bring nature back into cities, not just in gardens out there where you go on Sunday picnic or whatever, but something that you uh, work with and live with and interact with on a daily basis, what difference that would make to our disease risk. So that's sort of a premise we're working on. Mm -hmm. And as you've been digging in, how are you actually going to do this? You're going to plant uh, trees in a city? Tell us more. OK, so, so we, it, it's a very complicated thing to do. But we have a lot of um, belief that nature is good, and that nature is helpful, and it's beautiful and aesthetically pleasing. But on the other hand, we have very little concrete evidence of what good does nature do? What, how do we quantify it? Mm -hmm. Is there any? any effect, what are the underlying mechanisms? And that's what we worry about a lot. So we started this project, we call it the Green Heart Project, which is uh, in Louisville. And in this, we've taken a community of about, say, 23, 24,000 people. And then we are uh, doing a very high resolution map of the air pollution in the area, mm -hmm. and a sort of in-depth personal exam of seven, 800 people who live in the community. And then we plant trees, at, at one part of the community are different clusters, we have control clusters, have no trees, and then we see after three, four years, how does that change the disease risk in the community, walkability in the community, changes in social cohesion, and interaction with individuals, level of um, mental stress, so that we think that doing an interventional trial, that we would be able to get concrete, rigorous, and quantifiable evidence that would tell us how good the trees are, why they are good, at what location, what types of trees. And this project is uh, being funded by the National Institutes of Health when they want to look at, uh, so because we're worried about heart disease, but also for the Nature Conservancy, because we can't put small trees that will take 20, 30 years to grow. So we need to put very large trees and about uh, 10,000 of these large trees that we need to put in the community requires a lot of resources. So it is a very unusual partnership between the Nature Conservancy and the National Institutes of Health to actually test the idea in a, in a straightforward but rigorous uh, clinical trial. And mm -hmm. we registered as a clinical trial. Instead of giving people drugs, we'll put trees in the community. Mm -hmm. Now, I know that the idea of trees in cities is something that has actually captured the attention of many. Um, and we had a chance here to actually dive in on that. Maria, you have been part of a team that has built extraordinary buildings that essentially have integrated the tree into architecture. Can you tell us more about how these buildings are coming to happen? Yeah. So we were asked to design uh, uh, two uh, buildings in the center of Milan, which is a park district, and uh, we're trying to bring nature in this uh, part of the community. And not just nature, but we were uh, trying to get a considered amount, a good amount of uh, nature. So what we did was to design the structure of the building uh, in terms of hosting the trees. And uh, what we did is to have 800 trees, 800 trees uh, within the uh, 110 and 76 eyed building. So the whole idea is that the balconies are designed to host the trees which are three, six, or nine meters height, mm -hmm. and um, the water is uh, designed in order to, to bring uh, uh, in structurally uh, the irrigation to the, to the trees. And um, so we tested, the, and it's not ordinary nature that we bring to this kind of building. 
we tested the tree on the wind speed tunnel to understand mm -hmm. which is the exact strength of the of the trees that can that they can stand of. Um, we had the tree nursery specific design in order to control the root system, not to have the balconies eventually broken by by the roots. And uh, by the hand of this uh, process, we tried and considered that the vertical forest, which is the first prototype of this kind. Um, is working as an environmental device because it's um, taking out CO2, uh, fine dust particle, and producing oxygen. Um, it is an afforestation device in the sense that it brings, uh, a you can imagine that this uh, number of trees, which is 800, usually is on a 20, thousand meter square meter in uh, forestry and this is only uh, 1500 square meter in um, in uh, occupied at the moment um, it is a demineralization device so that we have uh, the cost of the uh, uh, heating condition and cooling condition lower because of the shadow because of the humidity that trees produce and um, it's a biodiversity device in the end because we have 16,000 uh, of small species, birds nesting it, and uh, um, humans also, of course, living there. And it's providing green jobs. We have vertical gardeners uh, at the moment, like cutting and taking care of the trees. And it's uh, an ever-changing landmark. So every season that you go there, it, you, you see a different building because uh, it's, the trees are falling, I mean, the, the, sorry, the leaves are falling, and uh, so every facade has a different species because uh, the species are also chosen considering the facade. So it's the idea of having a living uh, building within the city. Mm -hmm. I remember the first time I saw a rendering of it, and uh, it changes the perception of what's possible. And here in Chicago, we have a great number of green roofs, and we're very proud of the green roof on City Hall, and we've covered over parking infrastructure and turned them into green roofs, and those things have started to scale. And it's remarkable to think about the scale opportunities in these different options that you're presenting. And so, yeah, I'd love to bring you into the conversation yeah. to help us better understand how green buildings are scaling in China. Oh, it's a good question. But China is very big. There are more than 600 cities. I'm not the lead of country. Mm -hmm. So I can un answer your questions just from myself, my work, or m the city I lived in, uh, yeah, Shenzhen. Yeah. And uh, you see, uh, my name is Ye Qin. Uh, in Chinese, means green leaf. So it's my destiny to spend my life to research <laughs> green building and uh, uh, eco city. So uh, we have many uh, many cases green, uh, green cases in the Shenzhen and in the world. The famous one is our headquarters building. Fifteen years ago, uh, fifteen years ago, we built our headquarters building in. Dongchang in Shenzhen. There are more than 18,000 flowers areas in at the 3,000 land areas, and it it was uh, 12 flower, uh, 12 flower, and there is no gate and fence. Citizens can be freely go to uh, lobby. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think it's a concept of design. Every body is equal to the city. Yeah, they can go to the uh, building fluidly. The building belongs to us. We spend the cost to build it, but can be used by everyone. Mm -hmm. Not only for human people, not only for our staff, but also for grass, tree, birds. Yeah. So uh, we also there is hanging garden in the flower and the roof. In the roof there are uh, vegetable and uh, uh, f f fruit. So we can eat fresh vegetable and fruit about 30 minutes from land to months. 
Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the, the, the top flower is our uh, uh, cotton for staff. They can enjoy for every day. And in the third flower, we have our kingdom garden. Yeah, the children can take, the, take their parents to go to school because we spend more time to work. Uh, every day we work more than eight hours. So we have enough time to stay with family, with the children. So I think we can uh, go to back following the uh, children, yeah, it's special. So we also have many, the shape of building and the energy, uh, Using design is use nature, nature, wind, and uh, uh, sunlight. So there are fifty three percent energy consumption low than normal buildings. And uh, we also applied of we post uh, our construction post is twenty percent low than normal building. Yeah, because we spend less uh, documents. We just uh, use uh, sunlight, just uh, use nature wind. I think nature is so genesis. They, the nature is the best design. They do not need design fees, do not need <laughs> material <laughs> cost, do not need manufacturing yeah. cost. But uh, we do like this. I think many manufacturing and materials fact, uh, companies are not satisfied. But mm. I think we can find new way to new way to uh, earn money. Yeah, it's it's amazing you think about yeah. nature as the best designer. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And it's also interesting to think about the, the description of the many things that are possible when you recognize that we all spend ninety percent of our time indoors. And so this integration inside the building as well as outside of the building, it's end up being so important. Yeah. Yeah. So Michael, I'd love to bring you back in. As you've been looking at very different cities, one of the critical questions is how do the benefits that we're starting to understand and getting better data on, how are they relevant and brought forward to all residents? The question of equity. Yeah. How are you seeing cities around the world tackle this? Yeah, I, I mean, I, 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 I think the question of equity definitely starts from the top, um, and it's got to be something uh, that uh, mayors uh, and governors uh, and intendentes and two of my favorite uh, city leaders are here, Kirk Caldwell and, and Claudio from Honolulu and Claudio Rego, who used to be the governor of uh, Santiago in Chile. If you have to have that perspective start uh, and where that, you know, you can, where a, a, a leader really puts his or her foot down and says this is, this is going to be a value that we're going to have. But then the amazing thing about green is that it does, and, and green infrastructure, it does really open up these opportunities to do cool things that have real equitable outcomes. And so uh, uh, LA, for instance, um, has this great goal around increasing uh, the urban canopy and urban f forest. And they are using analysis about the most vulnerable neighborhoods um, as a place to start. Um, and so it allows you, so you get all these other benefits, uh, you get increased shade, and they're breaking the urban heat island, so this really starts as a, um, you know, uh, as a uh, climate adaptation play. Um, but you get all these other benefits that the doctor uh, was talking about, around health, about mental health, um, we're starting to see quantification of that, um, uh, and around um, uh, development uh, for the most poor and vulnerable. So that's the kind of thing that you can do really nicely and easily if you have that value to start. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Right. So I just want to add to the importance of the problem. We've built cities around, at least in the United States, but we are here in Chicago. If you look at the center of Chicago to the south side and to, the, to, to other places, within a distance of five miles, the life expectancy difference is 30 years. Mm -hmm. in, in New Orleans, it's 17 years. In Louisville, it is about 12 years. To me, it seems inconceivable that we could be talking about other problems 
right? When, when we have this sort of situation that we created within our urban environments, uh, I could devote the rest of my life trying to figure out to find a new stent or a new uh, statin. Well, you know, the difference I will make like maybe 2% or 5% in somebody's life. But yeah. if I can understand why this gradient is, you can add, you know, 15 to 30 years to the life of an average person who lives in a city. And uh, to, to that extent, it is, uh, to me, seems to be the most critical problem that we need to address. And so nature is one way of doing this. There was a study in, in Lancet that shows that as you have a low socioeconomic status, you have more of our disease. But if you then add in green spaces, that the dis difference disappears. So that if you live in environments that are pleasant to you, irrespective of your socioeconomic status or income or education, living around present, uh, pleasant environments and natural environments actually decreases disease burden and equalizes some of the in health inequities we see around the major US cities today. Can, can I just very quickly uh, add, tell a story to add on that? So some of the best research around community cohesion and the impact during disasters comes from the Chicago heat wave of the, in, the, in the 90s that killed 700 people. And as an NYU sociologist, Eric Kleinenberg, who looked at, at communities and actually communities with similar poverty rates, but very different um, sort of street uh, setups and cultures, where you had thriving street life with integrated, you know, with, with community institutions versus uh, 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 no street life with, uh, you know, people alone in their own uh, homes. Those two communities, even though they had about the same amount of air conditioners per household, they had very different outcomes uh, and, and, and sort of green infrastructure uh, and the power of nature speaks to some of that as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, <coughs> the ecology of our city is one that we forget until it comes back into a biological layer, but really it's about understanding an ecosystem. Yeah. And so the story you, you remind us of is extraordinary in looking at what the urban environment can do to promote health, and a lot of that comes to cultural health, community health. And so, Maria, I'd love to get another perspective. Bosco Verticale, the buildings that you showed are not the only ones you're thinking about, and they're not the only communities you're thinking about. So you're talking about bringing these concepts into social housing. Help yeah. us understand some of that. We, like, there are two main issues that we're trying to promote. The first one is that um, um, the first prototype of Bosco Verticale was for luxury apartment, and that's our uh, point. So uh, we are now working on uh, kind of innovation, and. Uh, uh, we are uh, building under construction at the moment. Uh, it's a tower in uh, Holland, in um, Utrecht. So the idea is to use precast and to devote this building for uh, social housing in order to have a different, com uh, completely different type of uh, uh, users that are going to um, live uh, in the building. And uh, the other thing, uh, it's important that we, we try really to, to uh, propose a way in which not just building, but also uh, urban planning, and uh, we, we do kind of a lot of master plan as well, to introduce the, the, in the structure of the city uh, nature and nature-based solutions. For example, um, we did the master plan for Tirana, so the, the capital of Albania. And um, so we, we designed the, the, the proposal for the city in order to have a green system which is much integrated in a city which was not green at all. And there is a strong political commitment to implement, and that's a very important issue. But the mayor of um, Tirana, Erion Veliai, uh, decided to take this call, and only in one plantation year, it, it planted 100,000 trees. Mm because he thought that was the challenge that the city had to face. So we need to design the city in order to have trees and plants and uh, green infrastructure. And we ha need to have the political will that embrace this kind of uh, idea, which is uh, very important. And mayors have an extraordinary plate. Um, in urban planning is critically one of the roles that they often play. And it's interesting to think about urban planning essentially as disease prevention. Right. and the role of trees in nature about health. Right. And that's really what we're hearing consistently. And so, Aruni, are doctors urban planners? Are urban planners doctors? How do we bring this together? <laughs> it, it, well, it, it's, it's, a, it's a movement. And it, it's, a, it's a, a cause that I think we need to uh, bring to the medical community, yeah. the insurance community, as well as the urban planning community. 
we design these buildings and we houses and the cities. I don't know how many you know, physicians or medical professionals are consulted of what these buildings will do to our health. And I think which should be the primary condition. I think if health is a precondition to well-being and flourishing and human freedom, that's what we should consider. But there is a deeper uh, sort of change in worldview that we need to bring, and that is, for many years we've heard how the environment is a source of disease and pestilence is changing. There'll be tornadoes and floods and sea levels are rising. Everything bad that we can think emanates from the environment as if environment was the enemy. But we're trying to change the conversation that no, healthy green environments could be a source of health and well-being and pleasure and meaning that has been taken away from our debate on environment. Even uh, when I was talking to people in the National Institutes of Health, uh, they said that all, they have a National Environmental Health Institute. All they talk about is how different chemicals and poisons and things in the environment, nobody's come to say that the environment can have a positive influence on people's lives. So we need to change the conversation and figure out ways in how the environment could be healthy, but we cannot alone do it. Certainly the, the medical community is gonna be the last to respond, but we need to start with architects and urban planners and people who worry about urban living and so that we can then collectively address this issue, which is not only just an issue that in, in the developed world, in the developing countries, there was a report from the State Department, and it says that in the next 10 years, the global GDP of the developing countries, which, which is currently about, uh, it's about $240 trillion, or $24 trillion, and that that's going to be, be, not, be exceeded by the cost of the NCDs, or the non-communicable diseases, that's in the developing world. So that will create wars and floods and migrations and, and, and disease. And so that, I think, is the big epidemic that we need to be careful about. And if nature is even a small measure of an answer, then we should explore all its possibilities. Mm -hmm. You mentioned the many professions. And uh, to your left is an architect. Yeah. So yeah, I'd love it if you could tell us more about how do green elements come together in buildings? Yeah. There are many elements, but I think four is important. The four are important. Mm -hmm. One is concept and uh, business model and technology and education. Mm -hmm. uh, I think concept is the first Im most important. Do you know the philosopher French, the f very famous French philosopher Jean Borrow uh, said, mm -hmm. yeah, he said, the life is C between B and D. That means uh, the life is a choice from birth to death. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, everyone have chance to had to chance, but we all make chances that our chances make make us. In the end, our chances make us. Yeah, so. Uh, I believe that the green mind and thinking way are the most critical. And the collector is uh, let us to do uh, right things. And the other element uh, lead us to do things right and efficient. Yeah. The choices are what this conference is all about, this forum, thinking about the choices before mayors and the choices before all of us. And I'd love to give everyone in the audience a choice, which is the opportunity to ask a question or two uh, of our group that we have gathered here today. So I know we can take questions from the mics, and we can take questions through the technology as well. So if you'd like to jump in this conversation, let's see, we have a hand over here and another. Hi, Scott Bernstein, Center for Neighborhood Technology. Uh, Dr. Bathnagar, um, it's been shown that uh, transplanting mature trees into lower income neighborhoods actually also has wealth effects, positive uh, wealth effects. Is your research uh, design robust enough to uh, measure those? I would encourage everybody to think about this because while at the end, if somebody feels better because they're wealthier as opposed to because yeah. it's green, we're still making them healthier, probably, than compared to where they were today, but it's important to understand the difference. So could you talk about that a little? Yes, so there is a, a very important connection. It's been estimated that for whatever for five extra trees within a block raises the uh, health of a family equal to raising the income by $10,000. So there are actually monetized benefits that can be derived from greenness 
in our study, what we want to look at is uh, that we want to see what happens to the area, its income, the house values, because we are concerned about gentrification. If you make the area green, that we would have people moving in. So when we were trying to design the study, we didn't want to go to a very poor neighborhood because then there will be a very drastic change in, in property value we and we'll upset that. the whole dynam dynamics of the neighborhood. So we focused on a middle-income neighborhood where there would be a small increase and that we would, would follow that. But in addition to, to income, we think there would be, we have uh, sort of following changes in, in things like crime rates, um, uh, in energy bills, yeah. uh, you know, water runoff, and also social cohesion and how this, the community together as a dynamic uh, entity changes by greenness. So both socioeconomic factors need to be considered for that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Now, I saw another question over here. Hi, good, uh, good afternoon. I'm Keith Williams from UL. Uh, work that a lot of my colleagues have done has, has discovered that in, in an average American home, there's about 500 volatile organic compounds in the atmosphere, which came in through building materials and products that we bought. So it leads to two questions uh, for the panel. One is, what's being done to understand the human health impacts of all that chemical soup? And from an architectural point of view, what are we doing to build buildings in the future that are free of all that uh, chemical soup? Mm -hmm. So actually, we, we do research in volatile and organic chemicals. That is a basic uh, area of expertise. We have a Superfund center just to study VOCs and the effect on health. And generally, we thought these effects have to do with asthma and cancer, but we are finding more and more that uh, it, they can contribute to diabetes, insulin resistance, and heart disease as well. So we're very sort of aware of what the problems with VOCs has been, especially in a city like Louisville, where we had rubber plants and they were generating a lot of VOCs. But indoor uh, sources of VOCs are very significant, and the first thing that we need to take into account is the building materials that actually uh, exude things like formaldehyde and benzene into indoor neighborhoods, indoor environments, which are closed, and so therefore there is less exchange of air. So we need to figure out how to, to use materials that don't uh, sort of generate lots of VOCs, and then whatever VOCs are generated, they're actually removed, they could be biofilters, but interestingly, plants could help. And there is, there's a list of the uh, plants from NASA, about 10 top plants that can remove indoor VOCs. I'm sure you can speak to the topic as well, is, is that they could clean up the air. But it's not perhaps the plants themselves, but the microorganisms in the soil that can metabolize the benzene and formaldehyde and remove that from indoor environments. So we need to, at one end, lower down or minimize the use of materials that generate uh, VOCs. At the other end, try to figure out how we can remove VOCs from indoor environments. If I can comment Please. on that, um, for example, we are working uh, both on considering uh, how to have trees with even indoor in order to clean the air, because air pollution is not just outside, but also inside. And the other thing we're doing is trying, is trying to use uh, wood as a structural material. There are a lot of research at the moment that try to consider wood uh, also for tall buildings. So. Um, we won a concept stage for a, a tower in Paris that, that was shown before. The idea is to have the 60 meter wide building with uh, wood as a structure. Mm -hmm. And that's one kind of research in order to um, decrease the use of concrete and use trees in, uh, wood instead. Absolutely. And Michael, I'd like to ask you a related question, which is when you're working with mayors around the world, how does the topic of air quality, both indoor and outdoor, address the questions of resilience and health? Yeah, I, I have to say quite honestly, indoor, mm -hmm. we, don't, we, we don't hear a lot about it. Um, and that's just anecdotal. I, you know, we, we work with 100 cities, so I would need to really look back at the database. But indoor air quality has not been a huge issue. Outdoor air quality, obviously, yeah. um, in, in certain places, is a real big issue. And I can remember sitting in, uh, Tanya Mueller, who is the Secretary of Environment in Mexico City, uh, her office, she had live air quality monitoring, you know, uh, on a big flat screen TV all the time. And so there are cities for whom air quality is a huge driving factor. Uh, and they're looking at a whole bunch of different ways, including changing, um, you know, manufacturing, increased green infrastructure, changing uh, mobility and transportation as ways to solve for it. Yeah. 
which, which is not to say the indoor air quality is not a problem. Out of 7 million premature deaths because of air pollution, 3 million are indoor air deaths. And those are developing yeah. countries where there is cooking inside yeah. the homes, and there have been a great initiative to try to uh, change those stoves. Even in the United States, in the West, in Montana and, uh, and Nevada, there are people who are using wood to heat and to cook indoors, and that's a major source of air pollution. It's very high in countries like Mongolia, where the, in the winter you need knocked in inside with, the, with this heating furnace. So indoor air quality is a major contributor to global mortality. Mm -hmm. now, as you're all thinking about cities, and you're having conversations with mayors, you're having conversations with other leaders, how are cross-sector partnerships helping you do this kind of work? We heard a little bit, uh, Dr. Bhatnagar, from you're talking about National Institutes of Health or the Nature Conservancy's partners. And obviously, Michael, you work across the globe. But I'd love another example of how do its partnership make this possible? I can jump on that first. And uh, nature is uh, very much cross-disciplinary, and this really helps. So the whole idea, uh, for example, in, in our um, perspective, we are working very much on urban forestry to bring city to spread the idea of having trees. And one thing is, um, so you, we work all together for this cause. And the other thing, we need to uh, have all the sectors aligned, which is a huge thing. So trees and green usually is uh, uh, thought to be uh, brought by the public sector. So the public sector should do trees and green, uh, but we need all to contribute to that. So the interesting idea that, for example, um, Dr. Aroni was mentioning is that you have trees within the building, so people are taking care in, eventually. So the idea is that it, it's not just the public who takes care and grows the trees, but all the community does that. And this is a very interesting uh, turning point in revolution in, in, in considering that uh, greenery is uh, something that we all should take care of. Yeah. The trees. Yeah. I, I mean, I have one other quick anecdote there. I mean, I would say, in general, changing how cities function to make them more livable, sustainable, and resilient is a, a by nature a cross-sectoral exercise. One example, and I'm not sure if Hun Sang from Singapore is still in the audience, but Singapore, it, it speaks to the, le the levers that governments have, but that when they do it in cooperation with the private or um, civil society sectors can be very powerful. Singapore has doubled, I'm going to butcher these stats a little bit, so apologies, but the, the directionality is right. Singapore has doubled or so its population over the last 30 years, at the same time increased its green space by 25%. And that's because they have very strong incentives for building owners to build green space. They get extra um, FAR and, and area to, to, to build um, if they build the green space. And you see the, the green popping up all over uh, the city and, and the country. And so that's a way, it's not the classic public-private partnership where we go with a handshake, but it's pulling those levers across sectors so you get a really powerful result. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but that's the question you worry about because I think to be able to get a diverse audience to buy into this idea, we need to produce really genuine, rigorous evidence. And that's what you're doing. We're trying to look at what happens to people if they live in this uh, vertical forest. That's what we are trying to do, yeah. is we trying to understand what are the quantifiable benefits and what are, so not just uh, so show some association, but actually go back and see what is the causation and why this, the, this greenness is improving health. And once we have that evidence, then I think we'll have a more convincing case. Yeah. And it's interesting, you know, Mike, when you've worked with cities around the world, the question of nature in cities there's a, there's a health, physical health question. There's also those many elements you started talking about, which is absorbing rainwater, addressing heat. Right. So there's a range of questions. There's different levels of quantification across them. Yeah. So if I could ask all of you just one last thing to think through, which is if you're looking in a couple years ahead, what do you think you're going to see that's going to actually be more about nature coming through in cities? What do you think is on the horizon? Well, you would think that we would be able to um, bolster the idea that nature is an essential part of our everyday life and not something out there in the wilderness and that being around nature is something that we as humans uh, grew up with. There is a hypothesis called the old friends hypothesis where we evolved with our old friends which is bacteria and virus and nature and that with divorce from that that there's causes of disease and so if we can in the future make nature a part of our living that that would be the most beneficial effect of our 
activities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Maria, Anita. Uh, I really hope that the, there is a change in, uh, in our mind and to reconsider that trees and generally green system are part of our life and we, are, we shouldn't be afraid of them because there is, we love trees unless they are in front of us and they, they are dirty, they produce uh, leaves uh, and they, um, so there's somebody should, that should take care of, we should take care of them and we should start and love them as being living uh, uh, beings. Mm -hmm. That's our, my hope for in the next two years that we all take care of the trees yeah. and greenery. Absolutely. So, I, you know, if you look at uh, the world, the cities have massive needs, and there's a lot of capital sitting on the sidelines. Um, and so as we get better to this point about measurement, as we get better at measuring the benefits of green infrastructure, which can solve so many of these problems, I hope and I'm, I think that we will have improvements in financing mechanisms in a way that makes this pay for itself, whether it's tax increment financing around improved property values because you planted trees, or capturing the benefit of reduced heat exposure deaths or flooding, or any number of other things. I think that there is a real appetite on the part of financiers, on the part of citizens, on the part of academics to figure that out and bridge that gap. Well, we look forward to that partnership and that scale. And uh, Chicago, I suspect, will not be the only city in a garden after your work is done. Thank you all.